Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So far the word. <clears throat> In Christ Jesus, dear fellow redeemed, dear fellow citizens of heaven journeying through <coughs> earth. We just sang the words, be still my soul. Those words come from Psalm 46. Neither God who inspired the words of the psalm nor the hymn writer who echoes those words would have had to have ever said, be still, if our souls were ever not unstill. How still is your soul in general today, right this moment? Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. As we look and search for stillness and peace for our souls, that can only be found in truth. Because if we consider lies and what those lies produce and untruths and where they lead, they may calm things for a while. But it's only a supposed fix. Lies, falsehoods, and everything to which they lead ultimately lead to unrest, turmoil, and eventually condemnation. The truth found in God's Word is an indispensable tool for our journey through this life walking heavenward. God tells us His Word is a lamp to our feet. That truth guides our way. It is also that truth which gives us a benchmark or a, a point by which we can reference and evaluate everything else. Because God's word is always 100% true. So that is the one sure evaluation tool for everything in this life. And we pray that we use it wisely. Using these inspired words of the Apostle John writing Later in his life to the Christians, we seek to apply the truth test, God's truth test, in all things. This truth test is necessary in a false world. It reveals a genuine Savior, and it comes from true and genuine love. We read in the opening word of our, words of our text, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. The spirits that we are to test are any anyone that would proclaim something that would apply to us. I think we oftentimes use this to apply to false teachers specifically. Test the spirits as you determine what church to be a part of. Test the spirits to determine what you will believe in connection with God's word. And that is all certainly true, but it is also broader. Test the spirits for many false prophets have gone out into the world. False and misleading and deceiving is what the world is. And the devil, who seeks to use the world to pull many into destruction, is the father of these things. The very first temptation of Adam and Eve was built on a lie and deception. Jesus, in commenting on this, speaking to the, his enemies in John chapter 8, said... You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. It is important to use the truth test in every aspect of our lives because of the existence of all the falsehood and lies in the world. It's important to use the truth test in everything because our main adversary, the devil, is a liar and a murderer and the father of it and seeks our destruction. So if we are surrounded by falsehoods and lies, if we are surrounded by the kinds of things that can harm us, minimally maybe here on the earth, but also eternally in heaven, or excuse me, in hell, we need to apply this truth test. There's a definite need. 
And that begins with our evaluation of our own selves. Earlier in the same epistle of John, he writes, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, make God a liar, and his word is not in us. If we were, anyone were to maintain a holiness or some level other than pure and complete condemnation under our own sin, that would be a lie. But consider how much that lie perpetuates throughout the earth and in our day-to-day lives around us. I might have some problems, but you have more. I'm pretty good. I live a pretty good life. I'm a good, ex- externally good person. I'm a good citizen. I'm a good friend. And in that statement comes also the unspoken, so I'm not that bad. If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar, and his word, his word of truth, is not in us. Pay attention and and think about how much of what you hear in the world, whether it be advertising, in conversation, or just the general worldview and attitude of the world at large, think of how much of it is geared to make you feel good about yourself uh, at the expense of recognizing your sin. There's nothing wrong with understanding the blessings that God has given us and appreciating those and feeling good in the life that God has blessed me with and how I'm pursuing that with His grace and by His blessing. But if that comes with the idea that somehow I'm anything less than a full, complete, and condemned sinner, it is a lie. And follow that through a little bit further. If we have all this encouragement and all this effort and focus on we're not so bad, then why would we need a Savior? And if I don't need a Savior, then why would I pay attention to God's truth? And if I don't pay attention to God's truth, suddenly I'm caught up in the lies and the falsehood, which is the very reason that John says, Beloved, test the spirits, because many false prophets have gone into the world. So much of the falsehood and misleading things around us are detrimental to our spiritual health, and so much is inviting and plays into our sinful flesh. Also in this first letter of John, in chapter 2, whoever says, I know him, I know God, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. We are not liars automatically every time we sin because we live in an ongoing state of repentance. This, and so we recognize our sin, we repent and go to Christ for forgiveness. But if someone claims to know, believe, put their trust in God, but does not keep his commandments, that is a lie. Go to the Christian church as a whole in our world today. How many things are uncomfortable in 2019 the way that God has portrayed them? And so those outside of Christianity quickly dismiss them and believe the lie. But also with inside Christianity, there are those who also take a look at the uncomfortability of God's truth and morph it into something that's a little bit more palatable to the sinful flesh. And I know God, I'm worshiping Him, I'm following Him, but if I say that and at the same time I'm compromising and changing His word into something that is not His word, whoever says I know Him but does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. The world in which we live is so full of deception, falsehood, and lies. We need that truth test. It's necessary in this world so that we can apply truth. Because again, lies will only lead to heartache and ultimately destruction. One more example of that very thing. God says, uh, the, love of, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which some have coveted after they have strayed from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. The world says, the love of money, store it up. Get as much as you can. There's where happiness lies. And there's a both spoken and unspoken pressure. Get more, get more, get more, get more. If God blesses us with wealth, thanks be to God. But the love of money the desire, the coveting to accumulate that at all costs, therein lies, as God says, the potential and the reality of piercing one through with many sorrows. You look at the headlines, 
of those who have pursued this monetary wealth and earthly accumulation at all costs, and you tell me what the truth is. That solved everything, or they were pierced through with many sorrows. And yet the lie goes on. In this world, the truth test is necessary to evaluate what is true, what is not, what is healthy, what is not, what is life leading to life, and what is leading to death. When we apply that truth test, it reveals a genuine Savior. John goes on, By this you know the Spirit of God. So test the spirits, John says, and here's how you do it. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. It's that straightforward, but also that deep and involved. It's that straightforward. Everyone that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And he goes on, And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and now is in the world already. So without Christ, if there's no confession, no profession, no declaration of Christ, that is not true. Period. And it is a declaration, profession, and confession of the genuine Christ. Because we can say the word Christ and declare his name all we want, but if we aren't worshiping and declaring the Christ of scriptures, that is no Christ. So any spirit, any teaching, any supposed truth that does not involve Jesus Christ as our Savior is not true. John goes on, Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Compare what God's word says, confessing Christ Jesus as the Lord, the Son of God made flesh, who lived and died for us and rose again, versus everything else. Truth, confessing Christ, leading to life. We have conquered sin and death. We have, and Satan, we have the victory in Christ Jesus. All of that comes along with a genuine confession of Christ. All of that is lost without Christ. And so, again, in the same letter, of first letter of John, who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? And then in the same chapter, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And also, in the same letter from John, I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and because no lie is of the truth. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? No one denies the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he made to us, eternal life. The truth test reveals a genuine Savior, a genuine truth of who he is, the genuine truth of what he has done, and the genuine truth of what that leads to for us, culminating in eternal life giving us the victory over sin here, giving us the victory over death and Satan, and eventually ending up in the glories of heaven. Anything less reveals false saviors, false Christs. And if they are false Christs, they are ultimately anti-Christ and oppose him in every way. There is no forgiveness of sins apart from Jesus Christ. There is no salvation eternally apart from the forgiveness of sins. Therefore, the truth test, evaluating everything that someone would say and, and seek to apply to our souls, every, everyone who claims to be a teacher of God's word and ministering to your souls, as well as anybody who says any philosophy whatsoever, because there are many preachers who never have a pulpit. There are many evangelists who aren't evangelizing with the gospel, but will evangelize you with the philosophies and vain principles of the world. In some way or another, many, many people, far distant from any concept of a preacher or a pastor or a teacher of any sort, ultimately seeks to influence you by what they say, where they lead, and what they do. 
The truth test reveals a genuine Savior and exposes anything else as fraudulent, false, and death-leading. And this truth test comes from true love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. Even in, con in a conversation about love, we need to apply the truth test, because what is love, ultimately? It can be defined in so many different ways, but all of which will fall short and lack, with the exception of the genuine love, which is what John says here, God is love. God is not love as contrived and defined by mankind that is physical and sexual. God is not love as defined by the kind of love that gives somebody whatever they want because that keeps the peace. God is not the kind of love that's defined about whatever I can do to please myself and fulfill my desires, that's love. God is not the kind of love that says that everything that love does, everything that love does leads to earthly happiness. God is love, as defined by God, a love that is built on truth, a love that understands the reality and doesn't hide the truth. So love understands that we have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It is the love that understands that apart from help from God and, and His salvation, we will be lost eternally. It is the love that saw that condition, that knew the reality of our sin, and was offended by that sin, and hates that sin, and yet with love, undeserved in its entirety, yet with love, so loved the world and sent His Son to die for those who rebelled against him. God is that kind of love. God is love, a love that does not compromise his truth or his commands. God is love who, which moved him to send his son, and that is the love that we seek to show others. Love one another, for love is from God. Whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. A little bit later, toward the end of this letter, John writes, whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe, God has made him a liar, because he has not believed in the testimony that God has borne concerning his Son. And that is the love that he has demonstrated to us in Christ Jesus. God is love. John also goes on to say, we love because he first loved us. Our ability to show our love to God in following His Word, our ability to show love to one another according to His commands, all comes back to that genuine love with which He loved us and which moved Him to send a Savior that's revealed in His truth and that truth which is the test point for everything in this world. So we go back then to where we started. How still is your soul? Be still my soul, and we apply the truth, we have every reason to comfort our souls when they are not still. We live in a world filled with falsehood and opposition to our Savior. Our souls will not always be still. We are, we are sinful human beings. Our, we, we fail, we struggle, we're weak. Our souls will not always be still. But apply the truth test through the words of the hymn writer. Be still, my soul. Why? Well, the Lord is on your side. In every change in this world, he will remain faithful. Be still, my soul. Why? Because your God guides the future just as he has the past. And the wave and the wind still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. Be still, my soul. Why? It's a miserable sorrow I'm going through at this point in my life. Because it's so hard. I'm faced with challenges I can't meet. Be still, my soul, though dearest friends depart, though there be death and trouble on every hand, though all be darkened in this veil of tears, it is to better know his love, his heart. He comes to soothe your sorrows and your fears. Be still, my soul, the hour is hastening on, 
when we shall be forever with the Lord, when disappointment, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow forgot, love's purest joys restored. Be still, my soul, when change and tears are past, all safe and blessed, we shall meet at last. And that is the truth. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.